afternoon, everybody, and welcome once again uh, to the 30th iteration of these Bug House Square debates. For a good many years now, Rick Kogan has been a very important part of what happens here on the last Saturday afternoon in July. We're very grateful to him for his important contribution to this occasion today and those in the past. So please join me in thanking our MC Rick Hogan. Yes, it, it, it is the 30th anniversary, and hard to believe, though it is, for 30 years we've been gathering here to have the main debate and do those soapbox debates, and in general to celebrate freedom of expression and freedom of speech. It's a great weekend right now with the book fair going on across the street and for the moment anyway, sunshine here and relatively cool temperatures. So I hope we're all going to have a good time at uh, Bug House this year. An important part of what we do every year is to make an award that is symbolic of what these Bug House debates are all about. And that's the John Peter Altgeld Freedom of Speech Award, which is named for the man who was the governor of Illinois from 1892 to 1896. After a careful review of the facts of the Haymarket trial in 1886, in June of 1893, he decided to pardon the three surviving anarchists who, in his judgment, had been condemned for their words rather than for anything that they had demonstrably done. By pardoning them, Altgeld not only asserted the legal rights of the wrongfully convicted, but he also delivered a strong message about our American freedom to hold and to express opinions no matter where they may fall on the political spectrum. His action proved unpopular at the time, as you probably know. Standing up courageously for freedom of speech ultimately cost him re-election and it ended his political career. But nonetheless, as we mark the now 123rd anniversary of Governor Altgeld's pardon, we know today that it stands as a landmark event in our country's history of freedom of expression. It's in the spirit of such resolute defense of a key American right that the Bughouse Square Debates Committee in the Newberry Library present the 2016 John Peter Altgeld Freedom of Speech Award. It goes this year to WITNESS, an international organization working to help people use video as a medium of expression and as a vehicle for fighting for human rights. Witness champions all people's right to freedom of expression through a number of activities. It trains and supports citizens around the world to use video safely, ethically, and effectively to expose human rights abuses and to advance a number of important causes. It provides resources to help people understand their free speech and free expression, expression rights to document human rights abuses. It empowers individuals to employ the means of documentation and expression available to them, even in countries where free speech rights are not legally recognized. It supports the use of safe and effective tools for freedom of expression and free speech, especially video recordings, and it draws attention to citizen footage of underreported stories. And it helps to ensure that those who are exercising their free speech rights can effectively preserve and share their findings. Since 1992, Witness has provided training to more than 6,000 people in 97 countries. And the resulting videos have reached 260 million people. Recent projects have helped to expose exploitation of child soldiers in Africa, forced evictions in Cambodia, gender-based violence in a number of countries, 
and violent confrontations between police officers and civilians here in the United States. In short, Witness has long stood for the historic values of freedom of expression that were modeled by Governor Altgeld and that are on display annually here at Bughouse Square. And so it is an honor for the Bughouse Square Debates Planning Committee and the Newberry Library to present Witness with the 2016 Altgeld Freedom of Speech Award. I ask that Yvette Albertine Time, Executive Director of Witness, now come forward to accept the award. Thank you so much. Hello. Uh, my name is Yvette Albert and I'm incredibly honored uh, to be, for Witness, the organization that I lead, to be part of this incredible uh, event. Um, when I looked up uh, what, but I'm from the Netherlands, so bug house doesn't necessarily mean anything to me. So I looked it up and I saw that it had to do with a mental institution. So you have to be a little bit crazy to be that outspoken and to be able to exercise your free speech. But what happened, the reason Witness exists is in 1991, an ordinary citizen with a huge giant Sony camera actually filmed the Los Angeles police beating an African American man, and that man was Rodney King. And the person who actually filmed this is a guy called George Holliday, who probably was the first citizen witness almost 25 years ago. So we started an organization that believes that the truth, the visual truth, can lead to justice. So for the last 25 years, we have been supporting people all over the world to tell their stories and to turn those stories into powerful tools for justice. And video still, that Rodney King moment happens all over the world, including, as we all know, in America, every day still, right? And speaking of mental institutions, just last week, videos came out of Australia that showed youth being incredibly abused inside institutions where reports had been filed for, the, for a long time but only when videos showed up of rooted youth who were being shackled was actually something being done about it. So we think a lot about free speech and we think a lot about what does visual speech actually really mean. So for example, I'm sure that many of you are aware that a woman called Diamond Reynolds live streamed on Facebook when the police murdered her fiancé, Philando Castillo. What happened when she was doing that is she was sharing a piece of abuse that was very important for the world to witness. What also happened is Facebook took down that video for about an hour, right? So one of the things we think a lot about is who are these arbiters of free speech today? When is it Facebook's choice to decide whether this kind of abuse needs to be seen by the public or not? So we advocate to these technology companies to make sure that their platforms become more human rights friendly. And at the same time, we have resources for people around the world to make sure that when they are filming, they can actually be safe and effective. So for example, there's a man called Ramsey Horta, who you probably have never heard of. He was the person who pulled out his video camera to film the moment that Eric Garner was chokehold murdered by chokehold in Staten Island. His life has become extremely difficult because he's being targeted by all kinds of people, including by the, the police themselves, for speaking out and revealing a truth that the people in power don't want to see revealed. So we help with resources for people like him that when you share a video, how do you do it in a way that you can be safe? Maybe your name should not be on that video, safe and effective. Same, similarly, what happens to this, to your speech once it goes onto the World Wide Web? Will it still exist for other people to actually see it down the line? There's a group called Photography is Not a Crime. For 10 years they have peacefully in the community been monitoring police behavior. They had a trove of videos. Those videos accounts were deleted by YouTube. So history can be deleted in a snap second. So we need to make sure that the spaces where the speech that we all express are being preserved can be protected. And at the same time, 
we can use these videos to affect real change. We've seen it in the last 25 years where videos told stories that people wanted to deny and changed laws, put warlords behind bars and created accountability where there was none. So for example, in Rio, there are media activists, people who live in the communities that are facing a lot of very brutal police violence and they've pulled out their mobile phones to start telling a story about what actually happens when the police clean up their favelas and in the process kill, for example, a young boy called Eduardo, who's 10 years old. And their stories are the only proof and the only stories that deny a narrative that is being perpetuated by the media. So what's been going on with the Olympics is the traditional media are telling stories of a jaguar that's been killed because he was paraded out as one of the Olympics ceremonies. Now believe me, I, I, I'm in favor of protecting and endangered animals. But in the same week there were several other people of the community in Rio being killed and those stories don't end up in the media. So one of the things we do is we empower people to own their own narrative, to tell their own stories in a way that people can actually find them and in a way that preserves their dignity and in a way that they can make sure that their stories are told in a way that they actually want to tell. So um, I think as the artist Ai Weiwei said, a society without free speech is a barbaric society. When he was being surveyed by the Chinese government, he took cameras and he took them and he, put, he, he made his whole house armed with cameras and he filmed the police back and he filmed the security forces that were detaining him in his house back. So um, I am a, on a mission with many activists around the world to ensure that anyone, anywhere, can be a safe and effective witness and participate in freedom of speech. And I thank all of you here in Chicago for helping us do that. Thank you.